According to Elwyn Berlecamp, game theory pioneer, this is the best single published page in coding theory. How can one page have had such a big impact on an entire field of study? Well, it describes what became known as the Golay code, a simple code that's able to detect up to seven errors and correct up to three. That means that if three digits change during transmission, the code can repair itself on the other end. Its capabilities are so powerful, it's been used in all sorts of communication systems, from radio paging to space telemetry. None of this is to mention how it inexplicably pops up in purer areas of mathematics like sphere packing and group theory, tying itself to many sporadic groups, including the famous monster. The real elegance of the Golay code, though, is that it's a remarkably simple object to define. There are many ways to do it, and we'll explore my favourite construction in this video, which uses an icosahedron. From there, we'll explore why it's such a powerful object, and beloved by pure and applied mathematicians alike. Just a quick reminder to thank my patrons for all of their generous support. I've been including some extra details in extended cuts of my recent videos. If you'd like to see those, plus get all of these benefits, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, huge thank you to those who joined me for my recent 24-hour livestream, and especially to those who donated to Mind to support those suffering with mental health issues. We smashed the £3,000 target, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Also, also, I recently reached 31,623 subscribers. Thank you so much to all of those who have subscribed. It really helps my channel. I'm going to celebrate with a Q&A video in the next couple of months, so submit your questions to the Reddit link below and vote for your favourites. Now, I could just say, here's the Golay code, here's how to construct it, here are its properties, job done, five minute video. But you know me by now, you've seen my videos, I like to be thorough, to say the least. And the reason for that is just that it's far more satisfying to really understand this. But understanding takes time and we will need a few definitions and basic results from coding theory. Nothing too taxing, but from there we can really get our heads around this Golay code and its construction and it is so cool, I can't wait to share it. And the first step to understanding the Golay code is to understand, believe it or not, codes because in mathematics, code means something quite specific. Now, I went through this in my last video, so feel free to go and check that one out, but don't worry if you haven't, I'll summarize all the key information here. As brief motivation, we're interested in the problem of transmitting information, but we want to do so in such a way that we deal with any errors that occur during transmission. Clever codes know when errors have occurred. They can detect errors. Cleverer codes can correct them. Just a quick note about a situation where error correction is not desirable, and that is with passwords. No points for guessing what goes in here. People are predictable, and that's why you should be using a password manager like NordPass, sponsor of this video. The worst password practice is to use predictable passwords and repeat them across different platforms. You're basically one data leak away from losing your entire online profile. But that's what we tend to do. We're human, and there's only so much we can remember. NordPass solves both of these problems by generating unique and strong passwords for each service you access. See if you can predict which character goes in there. That's right, the greater than sign because this password is greater than anything that I could come up with. And even if I could, I'd forget it. I tried NordPass and I'm really impressed at its seamless integration, importing passwords from my browser and syncing across my desktop and phone. I genuinely feel safer knowing that my passwords are secure and if data breaches happen, I'll be notified so that I can take action. Protect yourself today with NordPass. Get exclusive access to their best offer at nordpass.com slash another roof, which comes with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee or use my offer code another roof at checkout. Sign up takes less than five minutes and your passwords will be safe forever. Thanks to NordPass and back to the video. You can find an example of an error detecting code on any book with an ISBN. Let's say you call up your local library to inquire whether they have a certain book. And for those who are watching in the near future who might never have heard of one, a library was like a big old fashioned building sized hard drive. And instead of a read write head, it had one of these, a librarian. So let's say you call up this local island in a sea of ignorance and say that you're looking for the book with ISBN 04862123X. Now, without even checking a full database of ISBNs, your librarian knows that this is not a valid number. What's going on here is that ISBN 10 codes have an error detection mechanism, such that if one digit is incorrect, you know. This works by doing 10 times the first digit, 9 times the second, 8 times the third, and so on, then we add all of these products together, and if the result is not a multiple of 11, then we know an error has occurred. X, by the way, stands for 10. This works because even though there are 10 digits here, only the first nine actually encode the information. 
The last digit is deliberately chosen so that this process will always result in a multiple of 11 for a valid code. By construction, if one digit is incorrect, then the new total is necessarily no longer a multiple of 11. It's worth noting that this code isn't error correcting. The incorrect digit in this case is actually this one here, which is supposed to be a seven. That means it's adjusted this final total by subtracting a difference of six times five is equal to 30. So the correct total is actually supposed to be 231, which you can verify is 11 times 21 and therefore a multiple of 11. But there isn't enough information here to deduce that this was actually supposed to be seven. For example, if we leave the one the same and just change the check digit from a 10 to a seven, then we reduce this final total by three and so we produce 11 times 18. So while this does detect errors, it cannot correct them. This final digit is also called a check digit, and they underline the whole principle behind error detection and correction. At the cost of including more digits, you can detect and correct mistakes. And just in case you have a book published during or after 2007, and you want to impress your friends next time you're hanging out at the local ancient hard drive, here's how you do it with an ISBN 13 code. You take one times the first digit plus three times the second, one times the third, three times the fourth, and so on. Add them all up, and this time the result must be a multiple of 10. These ISBNs, by the way, come from my copy of Flatland, which conveniently has both an ISBN 10 and an ISBN 13, so that you can see the differences. Information digits, check digits. It's a great book, by the way, that's one part fun exploration of life in 2D space, one part satire of the inequalities of Victorian society, and one part nightmare about the impossibility of imagining circumstances radically different to those in which we are raised, which kind of brings all the themes together. And as we've said, these codes are error detecting, but not error correcting. So what about error correction? Let's look at those next. Before we move on, just a quick note about terminology. So a string of digits is known as a word. A code is a collection of these words. You can think of those as the valid messages. A word which is a member of the code is called a code word. Now the length of a word is the number of digits that it has, while the weight of a word is the number of non-zero digits it has. Now for the rest of this video, we're only gonna be looking at binary codes. These are words that are made up of zeros and ones only. So the weight being the number of non-zeros a code word has, you can think of as the number of ones it has. Let me show you the first error correcting code invented by Richard Hamming back in 1950 at Bell Labs. This was back in the punch card era of computing. Their system could detect errors, but was unable to correct them. And if no one was around to correct the error, it just moved on, effectively ruining their calculations. Hamming was apparently frustrated at the number of mistakes and is reported as saying, damn it, if the machine can detect an error, why can't it locate the position of the error and correct it? That was my terrible American accent, by the way, and I apologize, but he was right. The code that Hamming developed has length seven with four information digits and three check digits. So you would use it to encode a four digit string like, I don't know, 1010. Let's see how to encode that. This diagram shows the relationship between the information digits and the check digits. So we start by putting the information digits in and then we follow this rule to produce the check digits. The rule is that every circle must contain an even number of ones. So P1's circle currently contains an odd number of ones so we need a one in there to make it even. P2 circle is currently fine as it is, so we make this one zero, and P3's also has an odd number of ones, so we need a one in there to make it even. So we have P1 is one, P2 is zero, P3 is one. And that is the Hamming code word that corresponds to encoding the information 1010. How many different pieces of information can we encode? Well, we're encoding information of length four. There's two choices for each digit. Two times two times two times two equals 16 code words. Repeat the process for all choices of information digits and you end up with the 16 code words that we have up there. Now by construction, it's pretty easy to see that this process will detect errors, but this code can actually detect one error. Let me show you how. The process we use is called nearest neighbor decoding. So we want to try and decode it to the valid code word by changing the fewest number of digits possible. Since we're trying to correct just one error, we want to attempt to decode it to a valid code word by changing exactly one digit. So let me show you how. Let's put this code word into the diagram. So let's say that we've received this code word. 
immediately we see that this is not a valid code word because this circle here, for example, contains an odd number of ones. So how do we change one digit to make every circle contain an even number of ones? Pause the video if you want to try and figure it out for yourself. You've got to be a bit careful because, for example, if you change this one to make the red circle even, then you've not fixed the problem in the blue circle here. The easiest way to do it is to identify which circles are bad. Here, we can actually see that all three of the circles are bad. The only way to fix all three circles is to change the intersection of all three of them. So if we make this one a zero, now all of a sudden, all of the circles contain an even number of ones, and we're good. So we change D4 to zero in our decoding, and that actually corresponds to the valid code word, which is there. So, pretty cool, but how do we know for a fact that this code will always be able to correct one error? And why can't it correct two errors? Well, it has to do with what we call the distance between the code words. Distance is just the number of digits you need to change in order to get from one to the other. And if you stare at these code words long enough, you'll notice that they are all a distance of at least three away from each other. Take these bottom two here, for example. To get from this one to this one, you need to change this this, this, and this digit, that's a distance of four. And all the code words are a distance at least three apart. A distance like this is the key to error correction. If we take two code words, C1 and C2 from the Hamming code, and let's take them to be as close as possible, which is distance three, and let's say we send C1, but during transmission, it changes to a code word that's a distance of one away, so it has one error, then the, on the other side, it will be decoded back to C1. It will never be decoded to C2 because that has to be at least distance two away. That's why this can't correct two errors because if it encountered two errors in its journey, then where am I going? It ends up there. And that means we could potentially decode it to one that's closer now a distance one away than the original code would appear because we always decode to the nearest neighbor. So a separation of three guarantees that if you move one away from a code word, you always move one back. So as it turns out, this distance is crucial, and that's part of the real power of the Golay code that I promise we'll go into shortly. For the time being, there's another property that this Hamming code has that's gonna be super important going forward. The property is that if I add two code words together, I get another code word. But what do I mean by add? When we add code words, we do so component by component. Now, zero plus zero is zero, exactly as you would expect. Then zero plus one and one plus zero are both one, also as you would expect. And then we set one plus one equal to zero. So this is addition modulo two. Another really useful way to think about it is as an XOR gate. So agreeing components give zero, while disagreeing components yield one. And when we complete the addition, we see that we generate one of the code words that we have up there. Now, a code that has this property, what we call closure under addition, where code word plus code word always equals code word, is called a linear code. Now, just a quick side note about that definition, because usually the definition of a linear code also demands that any scalar multiple of a code word is also a code word. But because we're in the binary case, we can actually ignore that condition. The only scalars are zero and one. Now, obviously one times a code word is still a code word and zero times a code word is just the zero word. But actually we know that the zero word is a member of the code due to addition because any code word plus itself is the zero word. As it turns out, this Hamming code is linear. I'm not gonna prove that to you. I'll leave it as an exercise. It's pretty easy to do. Just draw yourself some Venn diagrams and convince yourself that the sum of two code words is always another code word. Now, linearity is a very powerful property as it allows us to bring in all sorts of tools from linear algebra in order to better understand codes. If you don't know any linear algebra, don't worry about it. I'll summarize the key ideas here. The first thing linearity gives us is to simplify how a code is expressed. Think about generating a random set of four information digits. I don't know, like one, one, zero, one. And now I'm gonna split it up according to its ones. And if I fill these up with zero, it's clear to see that these top three will add to the bottom one. And I left this row blank because I think you can see what's gonna go in there. If I fill this one in with a one there, then hopefully you agree that any information word that I put at the bottom here, I can form from a sum of some of these words up there. So wherever the ones are, we choose the corresponding word up here and add them together. This is really useful as it gives us a good way of generating the check digits. 
So let's say I want to encode the information 1101. The information bits can be generated with the sum of these three information bits, which means the check digits can be formed from the sum of those corresponding check digits. So let's do that now. One plus one is zero, plus one is one. One plus zero is one, plus one is zero. Zero plus one is one, plus one is zero. And that corresponds to exactly what we have up there. Where is it? That one. So in other words, any code word in this code can be thought of as a sum of these four code words. So a better way to express this code is as these four code words and all of their sums. And these four code words are called a basis for the code. They generate the whole code. And just another quick side note about this definition. This set of code words is a basis for C if two conditions apply. The first is that any code word can be expressed as a sum of the basis code words. And that kind of makes sense. The whole point is that the basis generates the code. So we don't want to have any code word that can't be expressed as a sum of the basis code words. And then the other condition, a little bit more technical, and that is that no basis code word can be written as a sum of the others. And you might initially think that looks a little bit contradictory because we've said that every code word needs to be expressed as a sum of the basis code words. So why can't a basis code word be expressed as a sum of the basis code words? Well, it can be expressed as a sum of the basis code words, just itself plus zero times all of the others. So what we're saying here is that a given basis code word like B1, for example, can only be expressed as a sum of basis code words by doing one times itself plus zero times the others. All other possible sums of basis code words can never equal B1. That's all we're saying. This in linear algebra is called linear independence. But again, don't worry if you haven't studied linear algebra, this is the key idea. A nice byproduct of this is that if you have a code word and express it as a sum of basis code words, that selection of basis code words is unique. You cannot express it as two different sums of basis code words. And that's worth proving. Let's suppose for contradiction that we did find a code word that can be expressed as a bunch of basis code words and a different sum of basis code words. So all the R's and all of the S's are chosen from my basis up here. We can also assume without loss of generality that all of the R's are distinct from all of the S's. If the same basis code word happened to appear on both sides, we could just cancel it out. And after all of the canceling, we would end up with a distinct collection of basis code words here that are distinct from all of these. And now, here's where the magic happens. I want you to imagine adding S1 to both sides. So we get an S1 over on the left here. And if we add S1 to the right, then because S1 plus S1 is just zero, we just end up with the sum of S2 to Sm over on the right. So that has the effect of moving S1 to the left-hand side. And we can repeat for S2 and S3 and so on. So we get that all of the R's plus all of the S's except for Sm is equal to Sm. And what's the point in that? Well, here we have a contradiction because now we've got one basis code word expressed as the sum of a bunch of basis code words, which can't happen with a valid basis. So this is where we find our contradiction. So that means that every sum of basis code words is a distinct code word. And that allows us to count how many code words can be generated from a basis. Look at this expression up here. I've kind of uh, alluded to the number of ways we can produce a code word from here because imagine now instead of B1, we were choosing the coefficients of the BI to produce a code word. Because every sum is distinct, how many choices do we have for a sum of basis code words? Well, this can either be one or zero, this can either be zero or one, this can either be zero or one, etc. We've got two choices for each. So in total, a basis will generate two to the power of n code words where n is the size of the basis. And that agrees with what we had with the Hamming code because the Hamming code is size 16 and we have four basis code words, two to the power of four is 16. All of that is summarized here where I've also defined the dimension of a code. The dimension is just the size of the basis. So this Hamming code up here, for example, has dimension four. We know it has dimension four because it has 16 code words. Two to the power of the dimension equals 16, so the dimension must be four in this case. And I know I'm throwing a lot of definitions at you in this video. Bear with me, there's just a couple more bits of theory, no more definitions, and then we'll get into the Golay code.
So that's the great thing about linear codes in that they simplify how a code is expressed, which is good for practical applications with limited memory, where now we don't need to store all 16 code words, we just need to store these four. And you can imagine that for larger codes, that is a much greater efficiency saving. But the power of a linear code goes well beyond these efficiency savings. For one, it helps us to simplify this whole minimum distance thing. Up until now, you've taken me at my word that the minimum distance between any two different Hamming code words is three. But in general, it's quite difficult to assess the minimum distance because there are a lot of comparisons that you need to make. However, it is very easy to look at all the non-zero code words and assess the minimum weight. Remember, weight is just the number of ones that a code word has. What do we notice when we look across all of the non-zero Hamming code words and assess the minimum weight? That's right, it's also three. Coincidence? No. In a linear code, these properties are actually equivalent, and we can prove it. The reason I keep saying non-zero, by the way, is because technically the distance from any code word to itself is zero, but we're interested in the distance between two distinct code words. So we're assuming that that minimum distance is n, where n is not zero. And now I claim that the weight of any non-zero code word is at least n. Let's assume for contradiction that it isn't, that we can find a code word in here of weight k where k is less than n. We're going to take k non-zero because we're going to assume that c is not the zero code word. c having weight k just means it has k ones somewhere in there. And now consider its distance to the zero code word. Because the distance is how many digits you need to change to get from one to the other and we need to change all of the ones. So the distance to the zero code word is going to be k. But this is impossible because we said that the minimum non-zero distance is n and k is less than n, so that's our contradiction. To go the other way, we'll start by assuming that the minimum non-zero weight is n, and now I claim that the distance between any two distinct code words is at least n. For contradiction, we'll assume that we can find two distinct code words that have a distance of less than n. But to be a distance of k apart, they have to disagree in k positions. And now the trick is to add them together, because remember, disagreeing components sum to one, zero everywhere else. So because they disagreed in k positions, their sum will have k ones. In other words, it has weight k, and that is our contradiction. Why is it a contradiction? We assumed the minimum non-zero weight is n, and because this is a linear code, this sum is a code word. So we've found that it has weight k, can't happen. So this is indeed the case that the minimum weight and the minimum distance must be the same in a linear code. This is a really important fact, so I've summarized it here. And to solidify why this is such an important result, we just need one more fact that we're gonna go through before we analyze the Golay code, and it is this. If we know the weight of two code words, we can derive the weight of their sum. Now, instead of me just telling you a formula, I want to try and build up your intuition here. So consider what happens to the weight when we add code words together. Here I've got two code words of weight 4, but they can be any weight. And we're going to first assume that all of the ones meet zeros. And let's just see what happens to the weight when we add them. Clearly, because all of the ones meet zeros, we just get the word of all ones. So this has weight 8. But it's more interesting when some of the ones align with each other. The weight of the sum would be the sum of the weights, except these two ones have annihilated each other, reducing the total weight by two. And now what happens if there's two ones that overlap? Well, again, it would be the sum of the weights, except now we have two pairs of ones that annihilate each other. So we have to subtract two times two. And I hope you can convince yourself that the pattern continues. The weight of a sum is the sum of the individual weights, but subtract two lots of the number of ones they have in common. But how can I express the number of ones they have in common in a bit more of an algebraic way? Well, one way to do it is to take their Boolean product. Now, the Boolean product of two code words is just multiplying component by component. So, for example, if we take these two here, then their Boolean product is going to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Because you only get a 1 exactly when two ones meet, the weight of this Boolean product basically counts the number of ones they have in common. The other way to get your hands on this is to take the dot product of x and y, because the dot product is just where you multiply component by component and then add them all together. But that's exactly the same as the weight of the Boolean product, in this context at least, so I'm going to express it like that. We're going to need this formula later, so let's just do a quick example just to solidify it in our minds. 
So the formula tells us to take the weight of x, which is 4, and the weight of y, which is 5. Then we take their Boolean product and subtract 2 times the weight of that. Well, the weight of that is 3, so 2 times that is 6. And so the formula predicts the weight of the sum will be 3. And let's just verify. And when we add them together, we do indeed get a code word of weight 3. So it works. Beautiful stuff. Phew, I know I threw a lot of definitions and theory at you there, but I'll leave it all up here as a reminder. And thank you for sticking with me, because now I promise this is everything that we need to enjoy this awesome icosahedral construction of the Golay code. Let's do it. The first thing to say is that there technically isn't one Golay code. There are two binary Golay codes, but also two ternary Golay codes. Ternary meaning that they are constructed from zero, ones, and twos. As I said earlier, we're sticking with binary, and the two binary Golay codes are known as the perfect Golay code and the extended Golay code. Now these codes are actually identical, except that the extended code has an extra digit on the end. And it's the extended code that we're going to discuss for the rest of the video, and what I will refer to as the Golay code, as is common in this area of mathematics, because it's more useful for a variety of reasons, and it's more symmetric, and it's just a more beautiful object dare I say it. Now, the Golay code is pretty easy to define, but it can be quite tricky to construct and visualize. It's also not clear from the definition whether it actually exists. I mean, I hope it exists. It'd be cruel of me to tell you 25 minutes into the video that actually no, it doesn't exist. But anyway, let's look at the definition in theory, and then we'll look at the construction. The Golay code is a linear code of length 24, dimension 12, such that all code words are a distance of at least 8 apart. And you might be thinking, is that it? What's so special about that? And yeah, it seems unremarkable on the surface, but the code words being so spread out lends it some powerful properties. It means that it can correct up to three errors. If we take two code words which are as close as possible, distance eight, and one of them suffers from three errors, then it still gets corrected back to the original at the other side. It will never get corrected somewhere else. And being dimension 12 means the code can be presented with just 12 code words. So that is a lot of efficiency and a lot of error correction. Very useful in low memory applications where it is vital that your message reaches its target. More on that very soon. What was shown in this so-called greatest single published page in coding theory is that the code does exist. Let me show you an awesome way of constructing it that makes use of an icosahedron. If you've never seen one of these, it's one of the five platonic solids. It's made of 20 equilateral triangles, and every vertex is the meeting of five of these triangles. Now, I've numbered this one to show 12 pentagonal bands. For example, here is the pentagon forming band one. And every one of these pentagonal bands cuts one vertex away from the rest of the shape. So for example, here's band one, and it cuts A from the rest of the shape D, E, G, H, L, F. Now, because the code is linear and of dimension 12, instead of writing down absolutely every code word, it's sufficient to find the 12 basis code words, as they will generate the rest of the code. So, finding those 12 basis code words is the goal. Or as they say in Canada, that's the goal, eh? <sighs> Sorry. Each of the 12 pentagonal bands will correspond to one of the information bits, and each of the vertices labeled with a letter will correspond to a check bit. Now, like the basis we constructed for the Hamming code, we just need to know the check digits for each information bit. That way, whatever information we want to encode, we can just add together the corresponding basis code words to generate its check digits. To obtain the check digits, you find the pentagonal band corresponding to the information bit. So let's do bit one first of all, and then you find all the vertices which are not on the band and put a one in those columns and zero elsewhere. So all the vertices not on band one are A and then D, E, G, H, L, F, and then zeros elsewhere. And that is the basis code word corresponding to information bit one. Let's do information bit two next. And I actually find it easier to start with the zeros because it's a one for every vertex not on the band. That means it's a zero for every vertex that's on the band. So I start by putting zeros in A, C, D, L and J, and then fill the rest up with ones. Repeating for the rest of the information bits will generate the rest of the basis.
Now you might rightly ask, how do we know for certain that the code generated by this basis is in fact a copy of the Gole code? Because yes, it is length 24, yes, it is dimension 12, and we're taking all of their sums, so it is by definition linear, but how do we know it has this property? The fact that all code words are a distance of at least eight away from each other. Well, that's what we'll prove next, but we're gonna to appeal to this result here and say that it's actually sufficient to show that all the code words generated here are a minimum weight of eight. Now we're gonna do this in three steps, and the first step is to show that the weight of the Boolean product of any two code words is even. First observe that the weight of the Boolean product of any basis code words is even. You can either just trust me on that or you can verify it for yourself. And now take two general code words X and Y. And remember, the general code words can be expressed as a sum of the basis code words. And we'll write them like this, where the coefficients are zero or one to represent the fact that we're either taking the basis code word into the sum or we're not. And now let's take their Boolean product. By distributivity, we can rewrite this as a sum of Boolean products of the basis code words. And if you don't believe me, get some pen and paper out and expand this whole thing and convince yourself that you can rewrite it in this way, because now the magic happens. All of these bi times bj's are even as we showed up here. So we have a sum of even things, which is even. And with that finished, we can move on to step two, which is to show that the weight of any code word in here is actually a multiple of four, or sometimes in this context, we use the phrase doubly even. And how do we prove this? Well, let's add two basis code words together and see what happens to the weight. And we can use the weight formula that we derived earlier. Now we can see just by looking at these basis code words that they all have a weight of eight, and in step one, we showed that the weight of any Boolean product in this code is always even. And then putting this all together, we can take out the factor of four. So that proves that the weight of a sum of two basis code words is always a multiple of four. But what about a general sum of basis code words? Well, hopefully you can see that the pattern will continue. If we put another basis code word in here, then we get the weight of a sum of two basis code words, which is a multiple of four, plus eight, subtract a multiple of four, so the whole thing will be a multiple of four. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, I'll leave it as an exercise to you. If you want to do it a bit more formally, you can use a simple inductive argument, uh, and that will get you the answer as well. I've run out of board, so I've summarized these two facts here, and let me clear the board before moving on to step three, because boy, am I gonna need some room for that. Just a reminder, we're trying to show that no non-zero code word can have a weight less than eight. We've shown that the weight is always a multiple of four, so the only case we need to worry about is where the weight is four, and that's step three. There are no code words of weight four. To do this, let's split the basis up into its left half and its right half. Left half being the information bits and the right half being the check bits. We're gonna consider the left weight and the right weight. And obviously the weight of an entire code word will be equal to its left weight plus its right weight. Now notice first of all that there are no ones in common in the left half. That means that the left weight of a sum of basis code words will be equal to the number of code words in the sum. So for example, if I choose three of these basis code words and add them together, then the left weight will clearly be three. Put a pin in that and then think about how could we possibly generate a code word of weight four? Well, hopefully it's easy to see that if the total weight of a code word is four, then its left weight must be one of these possibilities and the right weight must be one of those possibilities. There are only five cases. Now we can rule some of these out straight away. Clearly the top one is impossible because if it has a left weight of four, that corresponds to the empty sum and in which case the entire thing is the zero word, which means the right weight must also be zero. So we can knock that case out straight away. The second case is also pretty clearly impossible because if the left weight is one, that means we are looking at one of our basis code words, which means the right weight is definitely seven because all these basis code words have a right weight of seven. So this second case is impossible. Now it gets tricky. Is it possible to add together two basis code words in such a way that we get a right weight of two? Well, no, you could brute force this. Just take any combination of two basis code words, add them together and observe that the right weight always turns out to actually be 10 or six. But brute force is kind of boring and it doesn't really give us an understanding of what's going on. So let's go back to this icosahedron. Now imagine selecting two basis code words. Each basis code word corresponds to one of these pentagonal bands. That's how we generated them. But now notice that each pentagonal band 
circles one of the vertices. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the pentagonal bands and the vertices. And I've labeled this deliberately so that band one circles vertex A, band two circles vertex B, band three circles vertex C, and so on, all the way down to band 12, which circles L. The punchline is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between selections of basis code words and selections of vertices on the icosahedron. And why do we care about that? Well, it allows us to categorize the various sums of basis code words by appealing to the symmetry of this icosahedron. For example, if I chose to add the first two basis code words, that corresponds to selecting vertex A and vertex B on the icosahedron. Whatever the total weight of that sum, it will be the same total weight as the sum of A and C, i.e. the sum of the first and third basis code words, or A and K, i.e. the sum of the first and the eleventh basis code words. And that allows us to classify the cases of the additions based on the adjacency relationship on the icosahedron. So how many cases of weights of sums do we have over there is asking the same question is how many ways are there of choosing two vertices on the icosahedron where the only thing we care about is how separated they are. Well, if we fix vertex A, how many cases are there for the second vertex? The second vertex could be adjacent to A, so it's on this band one up here. It could be a separation of two from A, so it's one of these vertices down here, or it could be this vertex here at the bottom, which I'm gonna call the antipode of A. So there are three cases to consider. And due to symmetry, it doesn't matter that I've started with A. I could have started with B and I get the same three cases. Just to make our calculations easier, I'm gonna start with A and it doesn't matter what the choice of the second vertex is, AB will represent the adjacent case, AD will represent the not adjacent case, but not antipode case, and AF will represent the antipode case. And if you go through the motions, the AB case means adding the first two basis code words together, and if you do that, you get a right weight of six, the AD case means adding the first and fourth basis code words together, and if you do that, you also get a weight of six, and AF corresponds to adding the first and sixth basis code words together, and if you do that, you get a right weight of 10. And note that these agree with the fact that we derived down here that the total weight is always a multiple of four, because the left weight for all of these sums is always two, so the total weight will be eight, eight, or 12, which are multiples of four. But the point is, the right weight is never two, so we've eliminated that third case. Now this fourth case is the trickiest because it's difficult to see what the various cases are. This time we're adding together three basis code words, which again corresponds to choosing three vertices on the icosahedron. How many cases are there of selecting three vertices where the only thing we care about is the separation between them? So we have three vertices to select on this icosahedron, where again, the only thing we care about is the separation between them. Let's fix our first vertex on A, like we did last time. Now the second vertex could either be adjacent to A, a separation of two, or the antipode. So let's say for the first situation we'll worry about is that the second vertex is adjacent to A. Now think about where that third vertex could go. It could either be adjacent to both of the first two, it could be adjacent to one, but not the other. It could be not adjacent to either of them, but not an antipode, or it could be an antipode of one of them. And just convince yourself here that whether it's an antipode of A or an antipode of B, it's actually the same case, because in either case, it's separation of three away from one and two from the other. I've summarized these cases here and given an example of a triple of vertices in each case, because now we can crunch through ABC, for example, is the sum of the first three basis code words and calculate the total weight for each case. And the result looks something like this. And again, because the left weight is always three, the total weight will always be 12 or eight, which agrees with that, so we're not in trouble. Now remember that these cases only account for the situation in which our first two vertices are adjacent. So whenever two vertices are adjacent, it must be one of these cases. But what about if no vertices are adjacent? So let's choose our second vertex to be D. 
And now, how many ways are there of choosing a third vertex which is not adjacent to A and not adjacent to D? And it's quite difficult to see this, so what I'm going to do is to think about if I've already chosen A, I'm not allowed to choose any of the vertices that are adjacent to A. So I'm just going to cross out the letters B, C, K, I, J from the board here. And then we'll do the same for D. And the vertices adjacent to D are B, C, E, F, L. And we notice that the only vertices left are G and H. Now G is a separation of 2 from D, but also 2 from A. And H is a separation of 2 from D and 2 from A. So these are actually the same case. So we have a selection of three vertices, each with a separation of 2. And if you crunch through this case, taking the sum of the first, fourth, and seventh basis code words, you find that it has a right weight of 9. And you'll be pleased to hear that we are actually done with this 3-1 case. There are no other vertex selections to consider. The only case that we might have is if we start with our first two vertices being antipodes. But then if you think about it, wherever you choose your third vertex, it is necessarily adjacent to one of the other two. So we are in effect just repeating this case here. So this 3-1 case is impossible, and more than that, that actually proves that the last case is impossible. Let me show you how. What would it mean to have a 4-0 case? Well, that would mean that the right-hand side of four basis code words sum to zero. Let's imagine that we could find U, X, Y, and Z, all right halves of basis code words that sum to zero. And now we do a similar trick as we did before. Add Z to both sides of this, and Z plus Z on this side will cancel out, and we'll end up with a Z on the other side. So in other words, U plus X plus Y is equal to Z. But this is impossible. Z is the right half of a basis code word, which means it has weight 7. U, X, and Y are right halves of basis code words, and we showed in the last section that it either has 5 or 9. So it can literally never be the case that these are the same, and that knocks out the 4-0 case, and we are done. So... The weight of a code word generated from these basis code words can never be 4. And since it has to be a multiple of 4, that means we skip straight from 0, and then the minimum non-zero weight is 8. And by the result we had before, that means that the minimum distance between any of these code words is 8, and thus this does in fact generate a copy of the Golay code all from the beautiful icosahedron. It's so good. I just love that it comes from this. Now this code was first proven to exist by Swiss mathematician Marcel Golay, not to be confused with Swiss astronomer Marcel Golay, who has a similar, and dare I say, equally intellectual face. Like many fathers of coding theory, he spent time at Bell Labs. Because of how widespread and influential these so-called Golay codes became, his single-page publication introducing them was described as coding theory's best single published page by game theorist Elwin Berlekamp. Yes, the title might be clickbait, but I'm literally quoting the guy. Berlekamp, 40 years after Golay, also, unsurprisingly, joined Bell Labs after completing his PhD in 1964. One of his advisors on his PhD, by the way, was Claude Shannon. Getting to have Shannon as one of your advisors? That's just cheating! As a testament to the Golay Code's power, it was used in the Voyager spacecraft during their flybys of the outer planets of our solar system. Images can be encoded as binary strings and transmitted but due to the enormous distances involved, errors are likely to occur. Moreover, the crafts have virtually no memory. They basically have to snap a photo and then immediately transmit it. That means if the message was too scrambled at the other end, the image would be lost forever. The Golay code was used because of its efficiency and its powerful error correcting properties and the results speak for themselves. Just stunning. And because both Voyager craft have now left the solar system, the Golay code is now a piece of mathematics that's traversing interstellar space. So that's nice. Berlekamp, by the way, was also a huge advocate for recreational mathematics and found a natural colleague in the forever playful group theorist, John Conway. As I mentioned earlier, my love for the Golay code is in its applications to group theory. What's the connection there? We can actually go on to calculate the number of code words of each weight in the Golay code. I'll spare you the details because it involves some tedious case-by-case -case analysis, but the bottom line is we get one code word each of weight 0 and 24, 759 code words each of weight 8 and 16, and 2,576 code words of weight 12. 
and 759. That number looks very, very familiar, does it not? Yes, this is a follow-up to my previous video on the MOG, where we looked at Steiner systems, specifically S5824, an incredible combinatorial object that connects many areas of mathematics, including, as we're about to see, coding theory. If you haven't seen my last video, don't worry, here's a quick summary of S5824. What is it? Well, we start with omega, a collection of 24 elements. Last time we said omega was the set of integers from 1 to 24, but it doesn't matter, it's just a 24 element set. And yes, that's how many of us Brits pronounce it, omega. Now S5824 is a collection of sets called blocks, and each block is a subset of omega containing 8 elements. But it has the special rule that every subset of omega containing 5 elements is contained in a unique block. Because the blocks are of size 8, we call them octants. And it can be quite difficult to get your head around this, which is why I made a whole video about it, introducing the MOC, the Miracle Octad Generator, a way of visualizing S5824. We also showed last time that the size of this, the number of octads, is 759, which is why this caught our attention. And this is the magic I want to show you for the rest of this video, is the fact that the Golay code forms a Steiner system S5824, and we do it by just extracting all of the code words of weight 8. So I claim that all of the Golay code words of weight 8 form a Steiner system S5824. And the way we do it is we associate to each code word a block. And the easiest way I think of doing this is let omega be the set of elements from 1 to 12 and from A to L, where the elements from A to L are just some objects, none of which are the numbers from 1 to 12. And then we say this. For example, look at this first basis code word here. This has a 1 in the positions 1, A, D, E, F, G, H, and L. So this corresponds to the block containing 1, A, D, E, F, G, H, and L. I actually planted the seeds of this idea in the last video when I used this notation to build Steiner systems. So this association shouldn't be too surprising. Now what we need to do is we need to check this rule here. This is the thing that defines a Steiner system. We need to say that if we choose five elements from omega, then they are only contained in exactly one block. Well, let's see what would happen if we fail that condition. Let's imagine that we find two code words of weight 8, both of which contain the same five elements. Well, then what would their code words look like? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know that they would have five ones in common. Remember that the way to count the number of ones in common is to take the weight of their Boolean product, like we did before. And now, what is the weight of x plus y? x and y are both octads, so they both have weight 8. Subtract two lots of five, so subtracting 10 gives us six. And that's our contradiction because x plus y is a Golay code word, and the weight of every Golay code word needs to be a multiple of four, so that's a contradiction. And we're not quite done yet because we need to show that every subset of omega containing five elements is contained in an octad somewhere. So let's do that next. And the way to do this is just to say how many five sets are there across all of our octads, because in total, we know that there are 24 choose 5, 5 sets from omega all together, because we've got 24 elements and we want to extract 5 of them, and that comes out to be 42,504. Now in a given octad, there are 8 choose 5 distinct subsets of size 5, and across all octads, every set of 5 elements is distinct. That's what we proved in the last section. So we do 8 choose 5, and we multiply by the number of octads that we have, which is 759. And if you do that, you get 42,504. Thus, every 5 set is accounted for somewhere. And thus forges a connection between the Golay code and S5824. And because S5824 is intimately tied to several sporadic groups, so the Golay code is connected to these groups. My favorite application of the Golay code is that it's the key to constructing the MOG, this gorgeous diagram that I gushed over in my last video. It gives us an incredible way to visualize S5824, as well as giving ways to prove many of its properties and ways to birth our beloved sporadic groups. And I know last time I said that we'd look at the construction of the mug in this video, the construction is what we'll look at next time. I'm sorry about that, but I felt it was really important to dedicate a whole video to this awesome Golay code. And with the foundation that we've established in this video, the construction will go a lot smoother next time. So make sure you subscribe to catch the next video, and I'll see you there.
Thank you so much for watching, and a massive thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. Now you might still be wondering, what was all that business about the perfect Golay code and the extended Golay code? What is a perfect code? And why is the extended Golay code so much more useful, and in my opinion, more beautiful? Well, it's interesting, but it didn't really tie into the rest of the main video. So I've included a few details about that in the extended cut of this video available to my Patreon supporters. So if you want to see that, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Remember to check out NordPass and use my offer code ANOTHERROOF to get exclusive access to their best offer, and don't forget to check out my subreddit to ask your questions and vote for your favourites for the upcoming Q&A. This has been another proof under another roof, now it's time for me to go lay down somewhere.